So let's look at some of the properties that definite integrals have. Now the first thing, because of the definition, remember we take the, the definition, we take the limit as the norm of the partition tends to zero of uh, the sum from over all the little subintervals of f at the representative point times the widths. If you have an interval that has no width, so you're going from a to a basically, then all of your subintervals can't have any width because your partition would have to consist of all the same number a over and over again. And so delta xi equals zero in every case. If that's zero, then the whole sum turns out to be zero. And no matter how you take the limit, the answer will be zero. So if we have an interval that doesn't have any width, then the area under the curve is going to be zero, or the, the limit of the Riemann sums is going to be zero. Now, Here's another one that kind of relates to the widths of the tiny bits. If we have an interval, and let's say maybe a is over here and b is here, and we slice it up so that we have points x1 and x2 and so on, here are two points right next to each other, xi and xi plus 1. So if we want to find the width of this interval, we should take xi plus 1. Let's take that would be delta xi plus 1, and we take xi plus 1 minus xi, that would be the width. Now, if we slice the other way, if we slice from b back to a, then when we calculate delta xi, since we're moving this way, we're going to have um, xi minus xi plus 1. So we'll get the opposite value for delta xi. So if you switch the order of integration, so instead of going in one direction, you go in the other direction, then the sign of your dx's or your delta x values will change, and so you'll get the opposite value for the integral. Um, it's another property. This is actually related to a property of sums. Remember, we know that if you take the sum from i equals 1 to n of some constant, sometimes some terms that could be changing with the index, then that same number is multiplying each term, so it could be factored out, and then you could, so you could calculate the sum of the terms and then multiply by that constant. Well, because a definite integral is a limit of sums, it has that same property. So if you look at calculating that definite integral, integral you're talking about taking the limit as the norm of the partition tends to zero of the sum from i equals 1 to n of some constant times f at a representative point times delta xi. But this is a sum. so you can pull the constant through that sum. You would have k times the sum from i equals 1 to n of f of xi delta xi. Of course, if we're talking about a limit, then this isn't changing. It will come through the limit. So you'll have k times the limit as the norm of the partition tends to 0 of the sum from i equals 1 to n of f of xi delta xi. And of course, this much is the definition of the integral from a to b of f of x dx with this k out in front. So because um, sums have this property that you can pull the constant through, integrals, being limits of sums, also have that property. You can pull the constant through. Now, one special case is if you have um, a negative, right? So you can think of that as the constant negative 1, then you can pull that negative through. So a negative comes out. That's just just wanted to point that out so you think about that. Just think about that negative as a negative 1, then it's a constant that you can pull through the sum. Ah, sum and difference. So you have the integral of the, of the sum, and sum or difference of two functions. You can split that up into um, the sum of the two. So for example, well, why is that true? If you think about it, it's a, it's a property of sums. Remember, if you have a sum, and each term in the sum consists of the sum of two numbers, then we said you could add up those numbers in any order. So you might as well add up all the first numbers. And then you could add up all the second numbers. You'd get the same result. So when you're talking about a definite integral, when you're talking about a sum. It's just the limit as the norm of the partition tends to 0 of that sum. So sum like this of f of xi plus or minus g of xi times delta xi. We can apply this property to this sum and write it as the limit as the norm of the partition t 
tends to 0 of the sum from i equals 1 to n of f of xi delta xi plus or minus the sum from i equals 1 to n of g of xi delta xi. We already know that the limit of a summer difference is a summer difference of the limits. So we can take the limit as the norm of the partition tends to 0 of the sum from i equals 1 to n of f of xi delta xi plus the limit as the norm of the partition tends to 0 of the sum from i equals 1 to n of g of xi delta xi. Now if it was a minus sign here, you'd have a minus here, right? Now these limits, that's the definition of this definite integral, integral from a to b of f of x dx, plus or minus this definite integral. So because integrals are sums, they have a, they, oops, no xi here now, we've made a smooth sum. Okay, so because, because integrals really are sums, or at least limits of sums, they have this property that sums have. You think about the sum of these slices being the area between the x-axis and the curve, and if we have three points, A, B, and C, and let's, let's assume our function is integral, integrable along all of those, so we have this sum function here. Um, what this is saying is if you add up all the area from A to B, and then you add up all the area from B to C, if you combine those two areas, that should be all the area from A to C. Now this actually would work um, no matter what the order of these points are. So for example, suppose that A is over here on the left, and then comes C, and then comes B, so that's a different, different arrangement there. You have some function, as long as it's integrable, it won't matter what function. So this says the integral from A to B, see the integral from A to B would be all of this area up to that point, right? And the integral from B to C, that would be the integral, but it's going backwards, so we'd get a negative value there. Add those two together, and what's left is the integral from A to C. Yeah. This is helpful sometimes when we're finding areas of pieces. If we can slice it up and find one area and then find another area, we know we can combine them or we can subtract them. Um, if we can find the big one and we know one of these, then we can subtract to find the other. Um, one thing to notice about the integral, we're taking a sum from i equals 1 to n of f at some representative point times delta xi, and then we're slicing finer and finer. So we're doing all these sums um, with finer and finer partitions and figuring out what the limit is. Well, if our function is below the x-axis, so let's say our function is a negative function, here's maybe a and here's b. If we do the integral from a to b, then we're taking delta x times a negative number. So we're summing up a negative value times positive. That has got to be, if you're adding each of these is, this is a sum of negative numbers then. And so, um, the sum of negative numbers would have to be negative. So you can actually be integrating from left to right in the usual way, but if your function is below the x-axis, you'll get a negative answer. So, so we have to be a little bit careful about uh, thinking about integrals as area because they actually give us a assigned area. If we go backwards, we can get a negative value, or if, if our function is below the x-axis, we can get a negative value. So sometimes we'll see that our function will actually kind of cancel itself out. Think about, um, let's just do sine here. Here's negative pi, there's 0, and there's pi. The sine comes up and goes back down on this side, and over here it spends all its time underneath the axis. So, but because of the symmetry in the sine function, we can see that if we were to do the integral from minus pi to pi of sine x dx, and for each slice over here that has a positive value, there's a corresponding slice over here that has the opposite value. And so if we add up all of these slices, we're going to get 0. In fact, that's true for any odd function. If f of x, f of negative x is equal to negative f of x, that's the test for an odd function. So if f is odd, in other words, then the interval, the integral, sorry, over a symmetric interval of 
f of x dx will have to be equal to 0. That can save us some time. Sometimes if we notice that we're integrating an odd function over an interval that's symmetric about the origin, we can jump to the answer pretty quickly. This, um, next idea is the function is positive, then the integral, if you have an interval from a to b and you're going forward, then, then all the values of f are positive and all the values of dx are positive. And the product of positive numbers is positive, so you add up a bunch of positive things, it's impossible for the answer to be negative. So um, once we have that idea that um, the integral of a positive function um, cannot be negative, then we could prove this. If, if, uh, if f of x is always greater than g of x, then that would mean that, I better not write there, that would mean that f of x minus g of x is always greater than or equal to zero. So um, this function um, satisfies this condition, right? It's a function that's non-negative. So um, if we take the integral from a to b of f of x minus g of x dx, that's got to be greater than or equal to zero. But that's the integral from a to b of f of x dx minus the integral from a to b of g of x dx by our sum or difference formula. And that tells us basically this conclusion here, that the integral from a to b of f of x dx will be greater than or equal to the integral from a to b of g of x dx. You can also see it from a picture. If we have one function g and um, f is always at least as big as g, then between some point a and b, the area between f and the x-axis will have to be larger. So all of this area would have to be larger than just the area underneath g. So basically, if f dominates g, f is always greater than or equal to g, um, then, you're, then you have this relationship with the integrals. One application of that idea is what we call the min-max inequality, because if you have a function that's integrable on some interval from a to b, if you take the max of that function, that will always be bigger than, so the max of f will always be bigger than f. And so the max of f is a function, right? It's a constant function that, that dominates that. Now, the area under the max of f is just a rectangle. So we have that the integral from a to b of f of x dx will be less than or equal to the area under max f, which would just be the, the height times the base, which is b minus a. On the other hand, if you take the minimum value of f, then f is always bigger than the minimum value of f. So f dominates its minimum. and Therefore, the, the sum of f of x dx from a to b has got to be at least as big as um, the sum of min f. So we have min f times b, b minus a, sorry, min f times b minus a. That's this min max inequality for integrals. So if we sum up, we've got these seven properties that can be, be handy. First off, if you reverse the direction of integration, it throws in a negative sign. If your interval has no width, then the integral is 0. If you have a constant, a constant can come through. It's basically a sum, so that can happen. Same thing here. If you have the integral of a sum or a difference, you can break it up into the sum or difference of two integrals. Um, this idea that lets us slice, slice regions up um, vertically uh, the additivity property, then our min-max inequality, and our domination theorem.